We will now commence our session for the day and proceed with the guest lecture schedule. This session will be chaired by Dr. P. Nagaraju. Our first lecture will be presented by Professor B. Iraya from Bangalore University. He will be delivering his talk on the topic Recent Developments in Borate Glass. Good morning to all of you. Again, we have come back to this session now, and we will start with this. Uh, of course, before we go for the actual talk, uh, I think all of you know about Professor B. Iraya. He has guided more than 13 students for their PhD degree, and right now, eight students are working for their PhD degree under his guidance. His research interests are uh, nanophosphors, nanomaterials, oxide glass, and he is a life member of IPA. That's what Professor J. Ramakrishna was mentioning about Indian Physics Association. And he is also the life member of some other organizations, including uh, the glasses and other uh, materials. And he is a chairman of BOS and BOEF. Bangalore City University, Bangalore North University, and a member of several autonomous colleges. And uh, if you could see him, he is a simple man for outlook, but he is very strong in the subject. I now request him to give his talk. So please uh, come, sir. especially uh, Professor uh, Nagraj and the uh, Science uh, Forum. Uh, from, uh, he, uh, uh, the uh, Science for Forum is headed by uh, Professor J. Ramakrishna. So he was uh, a very good uh, professor and uh, my guide is Professor R. V. Enviker, and uh, his guide is J. Ramakrishna. So, so from long back uh, I have met, now it is an opportunity to, to meet uh, Professor uh, J. Ramakrishna. So it, it's a very good move from uh, Professor. So, you know, Nowadays, so nowadays, uh, the basic science is uh, deteriorating. So it can uh, heard that in uh, all uh, degree colleges, the admission for BSc is very very less students, and also nowadays, uh, that NEP, National Education Policy. It is ruin that basic science. So I should say like that. So I don't know. So all PU students, they are opting only for engineering and medical. And they will not come forward for this uh, basic sciences. So this is also depending upon the government policies. Uh, Anyway, uh, it will go uh, like this only. I don't know where it uh, uh, it will uh, end. And uh, it's a very big uh, uh, setback now. And uh, this is all uh, government policies. Nowadays, uh, the central go uh, central government is also is not uh, encouraging researchers also. So since from uh, eight to nine years, uh, no projects uh, sanctioned by DST or UGC. Earlier, in, uh, in our university, all faculty members having uh, one or two uh, 
projects from BST or uh, any organizing uh, funding agencies, but it is uh, very hard to get uh, projects from uh, uh, funding agencies now. And I don't know, so because uh, there itself they neglect basic science. Uh, as uh, Professor mentioned already, without basic science, uh, no engineering, no medical, because without uh, physics, uh, engineering uh, students uh, will suffer a lot. And also uh, there is a, another move from uh, VTU, uh, Professor Nagras sir also told me, so they are going to remove all physics, uh, chemistry and mathematics in engineering courses also. But somehow now uh, presently, so it, uh, somehow it is uh, uh, managing. So it is, th this is all uh, very bad things going on in and uh, around the, our country and uh, in our uh, states. So anyway, we, we have to concentrate on this uh, basic science. It is my opinion. So without uh, basic science, science and technology will not improve. It's my opinion. So, okay, I will uh, uh, start my talk so that the uh, recent developments in the boring classes. So this uh, talk is, uh, I mean, keep in uh, mind that only for UG and uh, PG students. So I will not explain rigorous uh, experimental techniques, all those things. So just uh, I will give you a flavor of uh, the our research. So I will start uh, with uh, states of matter. Maybe you have uh, all BSc students and MSc students, they are, uh, you are learning uh, all these things. So states of matter, there are majorly three states of matter. Uh, there is a fourth state is also is there, I have not mentioned. So that is a, a plasma is the fourth state of matter. So here, the, it is uh, on the basis of uh, the arrangement of uh, molecules. So we can uh, classify the matter as a solid, liquid, and gases. And uh, if you come to the solids, so majorly there are two different types of solids, crystalline solids, and non-crystalline solids. So that crystalline solids, highly uh, regular arrangements of their uh, components. And uh, non-crystalline solids, also we can call it as amorphous solids. They are considerable disorder in their structures. The examples, the uh, glass, plastic, etc. So glass is the only material that can be fabricated from bulky to complex uh, miniature sizes that exist quite a long times. It is, uh, you can uh, see the history of glass is uh, 2000 uh, years back, uh, it is developed. So uh, you can, for that uh, you can see the color glasses in windows of monuments, forts, temples, churches. So like, uh, which uh, indicates that it is a very old, uh, 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 glass is a very old uh, subject. So once upon a time, the uh, glass is only a decorative, but now it is very special and uh, technolo technologically very important material nowadays. So similarly, many researchers, they are doing uh, the research in glass and uh, glass science and, and uh, technology with uh, rare earth element. So once we named rare earth, uh, uh, rare earths may be rarely available, but now it is used everywhere, everyone, anytime in our day, in and uh, out, in all our walks of life. So in all uh, field of science, engineering, medicine, technology. So you can see many applications uh, in everyday life, it's in all uh, sorts of our uh, life. So this is a very uh, 
uh, active field in uh, glass research and glass research, bioactive glasses. Nowadays, it is a uh, recent uh, field in glass science. So these uh, bio uh, materials have become known as bioactive, reacting in the physiological environment to form a bond between the artificial material and living tissues. So studies showed stable and uh, strong bonding between the bone and the soft tissues in a wide range of mammals, uh, mice, rats, all uh, that um, mammals, including uh, uh, human. A stable bone, uh, which is bonded, implant uh, in, in the anterior region of the uh, man, mandible of a baboon after four, year, four years of functional use, which was reported, one of the longest in uh, vivo studies of biomaterials in the primates, every, which is published. And uh, nowadays, uh, there is a lot of uh, research going on this uh, field. And uh, this is the uh, microstructure of bioactive glasses. So, and uh, if you come to the, again, why glass? So we can, uh, where we can find uh, the applications. And uh, you can see the materials at high temperature, which scatters all over the space suddenly to room temperature. So layman found a transparent colored materials. So this is the interest, how we can, uh, uh, that uh, researchers are developed in the ancient uh, days. Now, sand and fire, these two are rules to today's science and technology. So without uh, this sand and fire, there is no science and technology. So you can see in all, uh, in case of a quartz clocks, semiconductors and uh, glass, glass ceramics, in all these uh, cases, we need these two uh, things, sand and fire. So um, that uh, most of the research is uh, going on related to physics and chemistry. That is the uh, emerging trends in science and technology. To get fire, we need wood, coal, uh, electrical, induction, all these things like this. Glass is an amorphous uh, solid. It is a hard, brittle, transparent or translucent. It is also, we can call it as a super cool liquid. So this is the structure of uh, glass. This is a disorderness. You can see it is not like a crystalline material. So it is a, that's why we call it as a non-crystalline materials. So what are the requirements to prepare the glasses? So we need these three important uh, things. We can call it as a glass farmers. Some of the, uh, we need three important things, glass farmers, glass modifiers, and some dopants. So what are the glass farmers? Like uh, some of the oxides like borates, phosphates, silic silicates, tellurides, germanides, fluorides, lead oxides, there are plenty of uh, for glass farmers are available. And what are glass modifiers? So all alkali and alkaline earths and heavy metal oxides, which are uh, acting as a modifiers. And uh, many of the researchers now, they are using these uh, rare earth oxides, like uh, the all rare earth oxides, like samarium, erbium, terbium, uh, selerium, ne neodymium, Isoprosim, all these uh, which are very helpful to prepare these uh, glasses. How we can uh, make compositions in glasses? So we need all these three things. One is glass farmers, mod uh, glass modifiers, and uh, dopants, we can call it as activators. So we, ha we have to make compositions like this. It's like uh, Suppose if you take it as a glass farmers, that is in a mole percent, F we can call it as a, that is a farmers, M is the modifiers, that is also in uh, terms of mole percent, and Z is a activators, that is also in mole, pers mole percent. 
So any amount of uh, this uh, formers, modifiers and activators we can take, but it should be 100%, 100 mole percent. So like uh, I have given uh, three examples, you can uh, change any com uh, compositions like you can change formers or you can change uh, modifiers and you can also change activators. And uh, like this, we can uh, make compositions to prepare the glasses. How we can prepare the glasses? So we need, uh, we can look at this, uh, we need a, a electronic balance, accurate uh, electronic balance to weigh the chemicals. So that raw materials, uh, we can take it as uh, chemicals. So we have to weigh that uh, chemicals with a uh, appropriate mole percent. And by using uh, mortar and pestle, we have to grind that powders and that uh, we have to <coughs> transfer to a crucibles. So here I have shown a platinum crucible. It is a, a very high cost. So most of them are not uh, using this uh, platinum. Usually all researchers are using uh, porcelain crucibles. So we can uh, uh, transfer that powder into this uh, crucibles, then place it in a uh, furnace, so which is for heating uh, purpose. And at high temperature, we have to heat that uh, chemicals. Then we, after uh, melting, we have to transfer uh, to that uh, melt in between uh, two brass blocks. That is uh, that uh, process we can call it as quenching. So quenched onto a preheated brass board, and then we have to annealing that uh, samples so to remove the some of the thermal strains. Uh, we have to place that uh, samples in a furnace, uh, and that uh, annealing uh, may be within uh, 300 uh, degree centigrade. And uh, also sometimes we can take that, that uh, annealing should be below the transient temperature, glass transient temperature. Then we can uh, uh, have this uh, glass sample. Uh, we can use this uh, glass samples for different uh, studies. So there are uh, different uh, types of glasses uh, like borates, phosphates, silicates, telluride, oxyl fluorides. Uh, we can uh, make any type of glasses so, uh, and what are the experimental techniques uh, which we can use in uh, laboratories. So usually in our laboratory we are using melt technique only. So by using a melt quenching technique uh, we can prepare uh, glass samples. So we in our laboratory we have uh, a furnace up to 1500 degrees centigrade so we can heat that uh, chemicals up to 1500 degree centigrade. So as I mentioned, the annealing temperature should be below the transient temperature that is around 300 to 500 degree centigrade. And uh, in our laboratory, we are uh, measuring uh, density by using Archimedes principle. And uh, we, uh, we are also measuring refractive, refractive index by using a uh, bare refractometer. And we have uh, uh, U visible spectrometer by using that uh, we can uh, get absorption spectra and uh, also uh, that uh, emission and excitation spectra uh, also we can uh, uh, get from uh, PL photoluminescence uh, spectrometer. So that uh, instrument is not there in our department. We have to go somewhere. And uh, why we want to use that uh, lanthanides or rare earth oxides? What happens to that uh, glass? So just, uh, I, will, I will not go in detail about that. So that lanthanide, so you can uh, see that uh, the structure of uh, LN3 plus. So it is uh, go into that uh, uh, inside the glass matrix. So we can get uh, the different uh, types of spectra here. So sometimes uh, we are using uh, 
this spectra and we can analyze this spectra by, by uh, uh, to know the uh, how much of the absorption takes place what is the transmission all these things so i will not uh, go in detail about this here also so in order to improve the emission cross section and lifetimes the addition of various network formers and the variation of chem chemical compositions are to be performed which could change the asymmetry of uh, lanthanides and the covalence between the lanthanides and ligand okay so here just uh, have shown one uh, ftr spectra so this is a, a beautiful picture how we can analyze this uh, ftr spectra so you can see that uh, there are different functional groups present in this uh, spectra so that we have to assign that uh, uh, peaks to particular uh, uh, wave number and there you can see the there are uh, different uh, bondings like uh, symmetric stretching there is a vibrations that we can identify by using this uh, ftr spectra and uh, we need to know the phonon energies of some common uh, inorganic materials so this is uh, phonon energy is uh, suppose if it is high phonon energy uh, we can't uh, use in any luminescent properties so we have to reduce that uh, phonon energies for example if you take a borate glass it has high phonon energy to reduce that uh, phonon energy we have to introduce some alkali oxides so like uh, lithium or uh, sodium potassium if you uh, if you put it in a glass matrix so you can easily uh, reduce the phonon energy of that particular uh, glass matrix so this is just uh, what is absorption what is emission maybe you have learned uh, in your uh, spectroscopy and uh, this is uh, this are the energy level structure of trivalent uh, rare earth ions see energy level splitting why that uh, uh, energy levels are uh, splitting that energy level splitting due to three important process one is uh, electrostatic interactions and another one is spin orbit coupling and uh, crystal field interactions these three important uh, uh, that interactions will takes takes place within the glass matrix and the, uh, we should know the what are the energy level structures of rare earth oxides before uh, uh, apt any rare earth oxides and uh, why we want to choose this uh, dopants and what are their structure uh, uh, characteristics that we should know before selecting any uh, rare earth oxides like uh, i have given here uh, samarium oxide so what is the uh, wavelengths where it uh, it will em emit the emission wavelength of samarium is in the reddish and orange region and usually this uh, materials use in uh, display devices applications so like this uh, uh, we can uh, choose any rare earth oxide uh, on the basis of their characteristics and uh, their emission wavelengths suppose if you want to study optical properties so this is uh, we have achieved uh, in our laboratory so this uh, the we can fabricate the glasses up to a 150 mm long and uh, 10 mm diameter in the laboratory level again uh, how we can analyze this some of the spectra so for example uh, if you take a uv visible spectra or absorption spectra see there are many transitions suppose if you use a nd3 plus uh, uh, this is a uh, we have chosen this nd3 plus with a phosphate uh, glass also so you can uh, see how we can uh, analyze this uh, spectra there are different uh, transitions are there and also you can uh, right side you can see it is a pl spectra there are uh, that uh, pl spectra is uh, it's a 
emission spectra excited at uh, 355 nanometer. And we can also see, uh, we can plot the intensity versus time. Uh, we can use these uh, spectra and we can analyze many parameters. It's just uh, have shown. And here you can see, th this is an electromagnetic spectra in the visible region. And uh, these are all, uh, there are three uh, rare earth oxides. Uh, they, uh, they are uh, showing different uh, emission uh, uh, wavelength. You can see uh, cerium, it is around uh, in between 400 and 500 nanometer. And terbium, it is in between 500 and 600 nanometer. And europium, it is in between uh, 600 and 700 nanometers. So, so this is a, a standard uh, uh, emission uh, spectra. So we can also analyze uh, the color analysis by using uh, CIE diagram. So the color coordinates for all the samples, which we can uh, calculate by using the intensity calibrated emission spectra and the color matching function based on the, the CIE diagram. So here uh, just uh, have shown what, suppose if you uh, introduce a rare earth oxides, europium, uh, different uh, lanthanides, here you can see, at uh, UV light, uh, we can uh, see the different colors. If you use europium trioxide, uh, it will emit at a uh, red region. And if you use uh, terbium, uh, we can see that emission is at around uh, uh, green uh, region and CuO2 is at uh, blue region. It's like this. So these are all uh, uh, different uh, rare earth uh, oxides. Uh, if you pass UV light at uh, around uh, 365 nanometer, uh, we may get uh, this type of uh, colors. So these are all the, again, uh, absorption spectra for different uh, rare earth oxides. So there are different uh, transitions. And uh, this is uh, samarium oxide and uh, CO2. This is also absorption spectra. And uh, this is disoprosim and uh, TM2O3. So all how we can uh, select these samples. This is a luminescence spectra of gloss samples with a 2% of uh, terbium oxide. So you can see that green one. So that, the, that uh, luminescence spectra also showing uh, that uh, peaks at different uh, wavelengths. Again, this is a luminous spe uh, spectra for different uh, glass samples. And this is europium and uh, cerulean. So here you can see by using CIE diagram, uh, we can uh, see this, uh, this where it uh, falls that uh, uh, wavelength that is this uh, figure shows the tunability of the emissions from uh, greenish to reddish part of the diagram with increasing sensitizers. So this is, uh, of course, a promising mechanism, homogeneous glassy network for the electrolyte and electrolyte uh, electrode materials would provide a continuity for the mobile ion surrounding during the transfer from one electrode to other. So this is uh, some of the applications rating setup for optical waveguides. So this is our original work. So now we have chosen uh, this composition, terbium doped lithium aluminum borate glasses. So we have uh, prepared these uh, glasses. There are eight different uh, composition glasses. Why we have chosen? What is the special about this? So why we have chosen borate glasses? Borate glasses have a several special qualities that make them suited for use in fiberglass, including decreased thermal expansion, resilience to the thermal shock, increased toughness and strength, and resistance to chemicals and durability, and superior transparency and good solubility of rare ions. However, the negative qualities of borate glass is, includes its hygroscopic nature. It's very, very hygroscopic, and this can be removed by adding a small amount of alkali oxides. That's why we have chosen that uh, alkali oxide as a Li2O that can enhance the stability 
and produce moisture resistance and remove air bubbles from the glossy matrix. Li2O also increases glass transition temperature and decreases thermal expansion coefficient. And we have uh, add uh, that Al2O3 to borate glass network that can increase its uh, chemical durability by its uh, glass transition temperature, decreasing its thermal expansion coefficient and improves the optical uh, response of the material. So we have chosen that rare earth oxides, that rare earth uh, ions doped uh, inorganic oxide glasses have a number of appealing properties that make them excellent for usage in a range of photonics devices, including the abundance of the energy levels that exhibit a broad luminescence spectrum window. So among various rare earth uh, ions, the trivalent uh, terbium, TB3 plus, has gained a considerable interest due to its wide use in efficient uh, green emitting solid state lasers, white LEDs, neutron detection and medical devices. That's why we have chosen this uh, rare earth oxide for our uh, glass. And we have taken the X-ray diffraction spectra. You can look at that uh, X-ray diffraction spectra. So if it is a crystalline material, we may get uh, a beautiful peaks, but here, uh, there is no such peaks as uh, observed. So that is uh, the terbium doped glass matrix in the range, we have taken the exerted in the range of 10 degree to 90 degree. And uh, there is a broad peaks in all the cases around 20 degree and uh, 40, in between 20 degree and 45 degree instead of short peaks. So it confirms the amorphous nature of the fabricated glass. So there is a, a low intense peaks around 43 degree due to disorder structure of glass. And uh, we have measured the densities, the densities of prepared glasses uh, by using uh, Archimedes principle. And uh, corresponding molar volume also we have calculated. So usually that density and molar volume, uh, they are opposite in nature. So this uh, uh, graph shows the density and also molar volume of glass samples. And uh, this is FTR spectra. So you can uh, look at this. Here we can uh, see to find the functional groups, groups present in the glass matrix. Uh, FTR spectra exhibit many bending and stretching vibrational bonds, which gives the information about the local structure. So you can see that uh, we have uh, band positions and uh, assignments. So by using literature, uh, we can assign the that uh, band positions to particular uh, uh, vibrations. You can see that in between 685 to 690, uh, 690 per centimeter, so there is a BO and BOB linkage bending vibrations. Uh, which is observed at around uh, 900 915 there is a stretching mode of bo4 units uh, that is uh, present and uh, in between uh, 1010 and 1035 per centimeter orthoborate unit stretching vibrations are observed and in between uh, 1200 to 1017 bo bond stretching vibrations are, are observed and uh, so like this we can assign all the that uh, peaks uh, by literature survey, so we can identify the functional groups in this FTR spectra. So this is uh, the Raman spectra. So this is a confirmation of that previous uh, study. So what we have observed, uh, some of the peaks in the FTR spectra. So here, to confirm that, uh, we can do this Raman spectra. So here also it is uh, say, uh, that same uh, bands we have observed, so it is confirmed that that FTR spectra is correct one. And we did uh, this uh, absorption uh, studies, so that uh, uh, absorption spectra for all the glass compositions. Here you can see, uh, the, as concentration of uh, terbium increases, the intensity of the spectra increases up to a 0.4 mole percent of terbium. Thereafter, that intensity of spectrum decreases with increasing terbium concentration. So the reason is that 
the increase in the terbium ion concentration in the glass matrix, the, there is a formation of metallic uh, bond. So th that's why we can see this uh, uh, variation. By using this absorption spectra, we have calculated uh, direct and indirect back, uh, band gap energies. So the first graph we have plotted alpha h nu to the power of square versus h nu. So that is uh, alpha is the absorption coefficient. So here by knowing the absorbance of the glass sample and its thickness, so we can uh, calculate the absorption coefficient. And if you multiply it by that absorption co coefficient with the uh, energy, H nu is the energy. So that uh, gives you this uh, spectra. So here you uh, can see that uh, the energy band gap, it is around 3.6. So this is a direct band gap. And uh, here, if you plot uh, alpha H nu versus to the power of half, uh, versus H nu, there we can uh, obtain the indirect band gap. So this is, uh, these two we can call it as a talk, talk splat. So from this uh, we can see how that uh, band gap vary with respect to terbium uh, trioxide. So that uh, optical band gap energy, so you can see um, the direct band gap uh, increases up to a uh, 0.3 mole percent, then it is gradually decreases. So the, you can see the variation in oxygen bonding within the glass network, which results in creating a non-bridging uh, oxygen. This is the uh, reason why that uh, energy variation uh, takes place in uh, both direct and uh, indirect band gap. And the, we, we have also calculated the refractive index uh, we can calculate the refractive index by using energy band gap uh, theoretically and also we can measure the refractive index by using a bare refractometer. So that is matches and we have plotted that uh, refractive index versus terbium trioxide. So this is exactly opposite uh, variation of our energy band gap. So it's uh, as ex expected one. And this are the luminescence spectra. So that PL curves uh, shows the distinct peaks at uh, 360 nanometer, 387 nanometer, uh, which is uh, excited at uh, 270 nanometer. So by using uh, this uh, PL spectra, uh, we can analyze uh, the JO parameters that uh, we have not done. It is uh, still under progress. And uh, by using this uh, PL spectra, we can also plot this uh, CIE diagrams. So that uh, the science of uh, quantitatively measuring color is colorimetry. Color measurements in the dichromatic uh, color system are expressed in terms of a uh, colors. So that uh, by using uh, CIE diagram, so we can uh, identify, we can look at these uh, figures. So this is uh, uh, my uh, work. So still it is under progress. Some, some of the parameters, uh, one of my PhD students, he is uh, doing this work. See, the not only the educational uh, or uh, research, but also anything you wish, you have interest, dedication, sincerity, hard work, creativity, imagination, honest in evaluating merits and demerits. So this is to our students. So please adopt all these things in your uh, life. Field of research, how we can choose, how it is going to have any impact. So with, uh, it will start with a literature and you have to decide what are the merits and demerits of the field. What is your uh, expertise? What is your capacity? And uh, how we can uh, support who will finance all these things, we have to look into this. So nowadays so that uh, Google Chrome is a very useful weapon or tool in our hands to get anything at any time, anywhere in the globe, if it is available in a digital form. So you can use that uh, Google Chrome 
shared the information, exchange your uh, information and strengthen your uh, ability. So this is uh, for uh, our uh, young students. So this is one of the quote from Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda. Take risks in your uh, life. If you win, you can lead. If you lose, you can uh, guide. So risks uh, or research comes under same coin, have both options of uh, a lead or guide. So thank you all for patiently listening the present talk and looking for your comments to improve my future talks. Any thank questions you. from? Thank you, sir. So now the question hour starts. You can ask questions, comments, or any clarification if you want. Okay, uh, I think Professor uh, K. T. Vasudevan is asking a question. Yes. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, the what are the common functional groups uh, that you find in uh, glass? Common, common functional com groups. Common uh, functional groups like uh, OH, mm -hmm. and uh, usually you can see the uh, some of the water content. So H2O, so all the, um, we have to identify how much uh, that water content is there in a glass matrix mm -hmm. and uh, what are the hydroxyl groups are present in our glass group that we have to identify in uh, FTA spectrum. FTA spectrum. Does this speak, uh, it depends upon the environment, uh, but presence of other uh, uh, elements around yeah. it? Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yes, please. anybody? I think uh, one more question is there from the... Yes, sir, you can go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. The material is and the yeah, you can introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, this is Srinivasa and alumni of this college. Uh, I have passed uh, MSc uh, in the year 2018 from this college. Uh, as you said, the, uh, the functional group which uh, you know, you, you are finding as OH and uh, H2O. The, ma the material is uh, heated with, like in the muffle furnace, like 1000 to 1500 temperature and also annealed with 300 to 350 as you have shown. How come the water content will be like your findings, sir? Yes, yeah, still uh, it is there. So that uh, sometimes after uh, annealing also, so we can store in a desiccator. So since it, uh, borate glasses are very hygroscopic, so it e easily absorb uh, that uh, water content from the uh, uh, any uh, that surroundings. So that's why we have to check that also. So after annealing, we can't do that measurements immediately. We have to store in a uh, desiccator or uh, any that uh, tight uh, of that boxes. Uh, okay. Then also it uh, immediately uh, absorbed. It is a very, very much hygroscopic borate glasses are. So that's why we have to identify whether that uh, water content is there or not. So sometimes uh, it shows peaks at around uh, 3,000, 3,200 uh, uh, per centimeter. So there we, uh, we confirm that there is a still some water content is there. So it is not always shows that uh, peaks. If it is absorbs some uh, uh, that uh, any uh, water content, then only it shows that peaks. Otherwise, uh, it is absent. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, Ship has got a question. Yes. Student from uh, this college only. Yeah, OK. OK, thank you very much. No, no, he has got one more question, sir. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, sir. sir, you said uh, borate glasses are hygroscopic. Uh, sir, like they observe moisture. So, what is the solution for it? That's what we have to uh, remove that uh, hygroscopic nature. We have to add alkali metals. So, what uh, what I have shown in my composition, I have introduced lithium oxide. So, that will take care of that one. So, without uh, that uh, any alkali oxides. So suppose if you prepare uh, only borate, 
with uh, any borate content so that uh, sample uh, it will not uh, retain so that that is uh, immediately it absorbs and uh, you can uh, see that the water is nature on the glass samples so that's why we have to uh, add appropriate amount of uh, that alkali oxides then we can easily reduce that uh, hygroscopic nature yes anybody else sir i have one small yes, doubt sir. Sure, how sir. do you find out the absor absorption coefficient of the glass which you have prepared yeah so that is uh, if you take the u usable spectra that is absor absorbance versus wavelength that gives you absorb absorbance versus wavelength spectra so by using uh, that actually absorbance and uh, thickness of the sample so there is a formula alpha is equal to absorbance divided by the thickness of the that the sample that gives you absorption coefficient but you can't use that i is equal to i not u to the power of minus that is not minus. necessary because uh, ah. so uh, if you, yeah if you use that uh, formula uh, we need that uh, what is the uh, that incident uh, uh, right. intensity yeah. and what is the that outcome all those things but uh, it is not necessary there is a direct formula alpha is equal to a divided by d and you can uh, convert into 2.303 so that uh, uh, gives you directly the absorption coefficients so yeah. thank you sir uh, uh, sir I, i think he has got one more question so okay yeah hello sir thanks for the talk uh, i have a question where uh, you have uh, introduced a concept called branching ratio in your uh, presentation so what is the role of branching ratio and uh, what is it uh, used for why is it so important the concept of branching ratio yeah that is a branching ratio uh, which we can uh, uh, calculate uh, to know the some of the jo parameters z z of alt uh, parameters suppose if you want to calculate the different parameters jo parameters uh, we need that branching ratio that's why we have to uh, calculate that so thank let us thank uh, the speaker professor b iraya because you know he has uh, uh, taught like what he is doing in a class uh, therefore i assume that all of you have understood what he has uh, given in his uh, material so thank you sir so thank you excuse thank me, you sir. very much thank you sir last doubt sir oh, yeah la one yes, more sir. last question it seems sir oh. sorry sir sir uh, i am second year student of bcu and also intern at uh, center for physics sir uh, in the very beginning of the presentation you have mentioned that uh, glasses are classified as uh, uh, crystalline and amorphous yeah. so uh, not, not glasses the, solid the solids are classified as uh, solids can be classified as yes crystalline and crystalline amorphous. and amorphous so in the midway in the presentation you have uh, mentioned that the xrd uh, studies show that amorphous nature of uh, glasses so is that uh, exactly all the glasses are amorphous or what how yeah, can it, we it, say it, it, uh, it is amorphous yes yeah. so if it is uh, uh, that xrd spectra shows any sharp peaks That's then uh, we can uh, take it as a crystalline materials because yes. sometimes the while prepare, preparing glasses we have to quench suddenly suppose if you delay uh, that quenching time then uh, it will become a crystalline so that's why if you take the xrd of a pure uh, crystalline materials there you can find different peaks that is different uh, uh, planes crystalline crystalline planes we can see in uh, crystalline materials but here what i have shown in uh, xrd spectra we won't get any such uh, peaks sharp peaks we can't uh, find the sharp then only we can say uh, that uh, material is amorphous if we get any sharp peaks then it is not a amorphous nature so we conclude like uh, if if we since we are not seeing any sharp peaks so it is amorphous yes is that the reason yeah so okay. to know the that uh, amorphous nature we are doing that uh, xrd so we, we will not uh, get any information other than that from xrd spectra thanks thank you sir okay sir thank, thank you, you. Uh, let us again thank him for uh, the 
beautiful lecture he has rendered. Thank you, sir. have a presentation by Professor N. Shivashankar Reddy from Presidency University. He will be joining us online. Hello. Hello. Good morning, sir. Sure. Yes, yes. Uh, you can go ahead. Is my screen visible, sir? Uh, not yet. You are visible, but not your uh, presentation. Okay, sir. Uh, You are able to hear us? Yeah, I am able to hear you, sir. Okay, then uh, I think you have to present uh, your screen there. Please, sir, go to your presentation, sir. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sir, shares your PPT, sir. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just uh, just a minute. Just a minute. There is many files have opened. I'll say the PPT, sir. No problem with that. Yeah, yeah. one second. Now I think it is okay. There was a, some there was some problem. Now I will be able to share it. I think. Yeah. Ah, yes, sir. Is it? Uh, is my screen is yeah, shared? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. It is visible. You can go ahead. Yes, it is visible. Sir. Good morning, all of, uh, good afternoon, all of you teachers and uh, students. 
Uh, today, I'm here to present uh, some important basics about uh, infrared spectroscopy and uh, how this infrared spectroscopy is used to find the structures in the uh, oxide glasses. Is my screen visible, uh, uh, Tejas? Uh, can you please uh, help me out? Visible, sir. Visible, sir. So, uh, basically, uh, you can see the infrared uh, uh, spectroscopy is a, a technique which is used to find the structure in a given material. So, for this uh, uh, spectroscopic technique, we usually use infrared radiation. So, you can see infrared radiation is next to the visible radiation. The range is uh, 350 to uh, 780 nanometer. How uh, infrared spectroscopic technique uh, works? We actually uh, supply a radiation uh, to a molecule. Okay, you can see we, we supply a radiation to the molecule. That radiation, uh, there is a response to that radiation by the molecule. Okay, like it absorbs, it absorbs. As a result, it is going to vibrate. It is going to vibrate with a higher levels of vibration. Okay, it is going to respond, and uh, we can detect uh, this response in the form of a visual spectrum. So you can see uh, normally infrared uh, radiation uh, leads to a molecular vibrations in a solid. When an infrared radiation is absorbed there would be a change in the molecular vibrations in a solid. So uh, normally uh, its wavelength is in, uh, in the range of 10 power minus 3 centimeter. So this is all about simple calculations because we need to know the range of infrared radiation. Uh, uh, the wave number is calculated as uh, 1 over lambda. So these are uh, simple fundamentals. Now, this is where, which is very important to us, uh, the uh, range of IR. If you look at the IR radiation is divided into three ranges, near infrared range, middle infrared range, and far infrared range. So, for our glasses, say oxide glasses or any glasses, normally the radiation which is useful to find the structure in the uh, oxide glasses is this mid IR range. You can see its range is from uh, 660 centimeter inverse to, uh, uh, you can uh, go up to 4000, 660 uh, centimeter inverse to up to 4000 centimeter inverse. This is the radiation which is used to find the structure in the oxide glasses. This also can be used to find the structure in the organic materials, organic molecules. Okay, this is the range, uh, uh, very important. The mid IR range is the infrared radiation we are using to find the structure in the solids. So, uh, what actually, how uh, the uh, how does the radiation interacts with the uh, matter? Basically, uh, the, any matter contains molecules and atoms they will be in a constant motion, either a vibrational motion or a rotational motion, okay? So, as you supply the radiation, they tend to vibrate with their natural frequency. As a result, the, this, uh, this vibration is a characteristic of a particular bond, okay? So, when the, when the radiation is absorbed, this, um, when, the, the, when the radiation is absorbed, this is absorbed by a particular bond, Okay, so therefore, the absorption of a radiation indicates the particular, uh, particular bond present in a solid. So what actually happens, you can see a bond in a solid, it will be like a, a spring attached to the two atoms. Okay, this bond is a characteristic of the two atoms. So as you supply the radiation, they, it, it may it may uh, uh, it may undergo a vibration which leads to a stretching and a compressed uh, vibration it is like 
as if a spring is stretched or a compressed when energy is supplied to a, uh, a uh, molecule. The bond which is connected to the atoms that is going to undergo stretched vibration or a compressed vibration. As a result, this is a characteristic of a given molecule and uh, therefore when the radiation is absorbed, which uh, it can indicate a particular uh, nature of the bond. So what are the normally what are the type of bonds in which the uh, what are the type of uh, vibrations in which uh, bonds uh, bonds exhibit is symmetric stretching vibrations, asymmetric stretching vibrations and the bending vibrations. So I just want to tell you some basics, then I will go to the um, uh, actual uh, work. Uh, so uh, you can see uh, how uh, IR spectroscopy works. IR, in IR spectroscopy, we, are, we take a transmission spectroscopy or absorption spectroscopy. When a chemical sample is exposed to the light, the sample is going to absorb a particular radiation of the IR which is a characteristic of a given uh, molecule. And uh, the transmitter uh, the signal, the transmitted radiation is detected. The trans uh, transmitted radiation is detected by the detector, which gives the information of the particular radiation which is absorbed by the sample, which is due to the specific functional group or a bond present in a material. We also... Uh, so therefore, what happens? So we take a, a spectrum. We take a spectrum. This is how uh, in a, a spectrum in absorption mode. Uh, this is what how, uh, how a absorption spectrum uh, looks like for a material. You can see uh, the material has absorbed a particular radiation. It is around, uh, you can see, it is around 3,600 centimeter inverse. So this is how an absorption spectrum looks like. It's like almost like, a, you know, a, a spike. Uh, you can see it is almost like a spike. Or a, you can say um, uh, it is a, like a crest. If you look at the transmission spectrum, you see it is a reverse. Okay. So this in a transition uh, spectrum, we, we take a downward peak. And in absorption spectra, uh, spectrum, we take an upward peak. This is uh, very careful because when you go to um, when you prepare glasses and you take a FTIR spectroscopy, some places mm -hmm. they give a absorption data. Some places they give a uh, transmission data. So in a transmission data, the peak which gives a uh, which gives the corresponding vibration is the downward peak you have to take, and uh, in case of absorption peak you you have to take the upward peak. So these are the fundamentals I wanted to cover. Uh, you can see uh, now uh, classification of IR bands. It is uh, like there are strong bands, uh, there are uh, weak bands, there are medium bands. You can see here. The, how do you classify that? It is based on the the intensity, based on the length of the y-axis, or based on the intensity. Normally, intensity is plotted. You can uh, clearly see uh, this third band is very strong, and uh, this is a medium bond, and this is a weak bond. It based on the length of the y-axis or intensity along y-axis. It is because uh, some uh, bonds are uh, strong, some bonds are weak, some bonds are not observ uh, observable, some bonds are medium. It is because the molecule should exhibit a dipole moment. If a molecule exhibit a dipole moment, uh, then uh, that bond can be observed in the infrared uh, spectroscopy. If a molecule do not exhibit a dipole moment, then that cannot be detected because uh, the, the fundamental uh, uh, fundamental aspect of infrared spectroscopy, molecule should exhibit a dipole moment. If a molecule exhibit a strong dipole moment, then the intensity of that particular bond is going to be very high. And if, if it is a, a medium dipole moment, then the intensity is going to be medium. And if it is exhibit a weak dipole moment, if a particle a molecule is characterized by a weak dipole moment, the intensity is going to be weak in a absorption spectroscopy. So you can see the, this is the infrared uh, band shape. You can clearly say this is the transmission uh, spectrum. 
transmission infrared spectroscopy because the you can see that it is a downward uh, band it's a it's like a trough it's like a trough so it's a transmission spectrum and this particular uh, uh, position indicates the particular wave number and uh, a characteristic group can be identified so normally uh, this is also one of the fundamental uh, fundamental which is very very important uh, you can see uh, either uh, the the absorption uh, in infrared absorption frequency the frequency of the uh, vibration of a molecule is given by 1 by 2 pi root of k by mu where k is a force constant of the chemical bond uh, which is uh, for uh, which is between the two atoms and uh, mu is the reduced mass you can see if the force constant changes the frequency also changes okay and uh, uh, the um, reduced mass changes then also the frequency changes like in uh, in glasses if you take if a particular group if you are observing you are preparing different kind of glasses okay if you are finding uh, preparing different kind of glasses suppose say for example uh, just uh, i will talk upon this formula when i take to the next ppt like whenever uh, there is a surrounding environment changes even particular frequency suppose you are observing in case of borate group as uh, professor uh, irasr as uh, was talking about uh, ptr uh, spectroscopy of glasses he was mentioning there is a uh, uh, stretching vibrations of uh, bob bonds around uh, 700 uh, centimeter inverse if uh, that uh, bob group uh, is present in a different environments uh, the frequency is going to slightly change that is what i want to uh, press upon and also what is uh, more important is that this the frequency of vibration of a particular bond depends on its force that force constant so uh, with this i will like to take to the actual uh, work i have taken two slides i uh, prepared two slides to explain how uh, ftr spectroscopy will be uh, 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 like uh, will be used to find the structure of the borate glasses so uh, students as i told you uh, infrared spectroscopy you are actually triggering the molecule molecular vibrations through which uh, you will be able to find out uh, what are the type of molecules functional groups and uh, chemical bonds present in the material upon irradiation certain bonds respond to the uh, uh, radiation and vibrate faster the absorption of light can be detected by the uh, by detecting the uh, uh, transmitted light so normally oxide glasses uh, i took mm, oxide glasses basically uh, sio2 glasses b2o3 p2o5 to2 go2 mainly we say oxide glasses oxygen is major component in them and uh, the uh, by and large the role of oxygen in these glasses is going there it is going to form a bridge between the glass forming uh, uh cations so i took a borate structure normally the borate structure is basically made up of uh, trigonal borons trigonal borons and uh, tetrahedral uh, borons this normally these groups are present in almost all the uh, borate structures so you can see uh, this is going to be a trigonal boron and you can see this is a tetrahedral boron as such here also this is a tetrahedral boron and uh, this is uh, going to be a trigonal boron so how do you find the structure if you take the uh, ftr spectroscopy for a borate glasses uh, this is the ftr spectro uh, uh, spectrum for a borate glass uh, in which recently we worked uh, on a composition i think uh, i mentioned the composition somewhere it is not visible uh, so uh, this is the borate glass we have taken a transmission spectroscopy and uh, as i told you the transition spectroscopy if you take uh, these are the bands not these bands this this crests type of bands uh, should not be uh, uh, should not be linked to the structure the 
the, the strup bands should be linked to the structure. You see, uh, in the range from uh, almost uh, 690 to 750, uh, the, the vibrational bands are linked, associated to BOB linkages in pentaborate groups. So you can see there are uh, the vibrational bands here. So the presence of this vibrational band uh, indicates the BOB linkages present in a pentaborate groups. And uh, you can see almost all the borate glasses when we take a FTR spectroscopy, they will exhibit a, a vibrational bands in the region from 800 to 1200 and uh, in the region 1200 to 1600. In any uh, FTR spectroscopy of borate glasses, if you take, this is what are the signals what we are going to get. Now, 800 to 1200 uh, centimeter inverse bands are due to BO bond stretching vibrations in BO4 units. These are the structural units which are associated to 800 to 1200. So you can see between 800 to 1200, there are vibrational bands in the FTA transmission spectroscopy, and these are due to BO4 uh, structural units. And uh, 1200 to 1600 vibrational bands, that is in this region, they are associated to trigonal borate units, okay, BO bond stretching vibrations in trigonal uh, borate, unit, borate units. If you actually split this, there are uh, peaks which are uh, overlapping. If you deconvolute this graph, uh, FTR spectroscopy, if you deconvolute this FTR spectroscopy, there will be a uh, isolated peaks uh, can be resolved. In this uh, spectrum, it is shown uh, clearly. You can see there is uh, clearly that uh, seven, uh, sorry, 690 centimeter inverse peak, that is BOB peak, BOB linkage, uh, linkages, it can be seen in this band. And uh, you can also see that 800 to 1200, there are multiple peaks. One peak is around, uh, say, uh, uh, around 8, 800. Another peak is around, uh, say, 9, 900 and, uh, uh, say, around 950. Another peak is around uh, 11,050. It can be clearly uh, seen. Each peak is associated to a particular vibration. Also, uh, the peaks are also resolved between 1200 to 1500. You can see there are two peaks which are resolved. Even they are also associated to a particular uh, structural group present. Now, we also take an, uh, another, uh, uh, we, in, in our recent study uh, of the borate glass, one of my, one of my student uh, has taken the FTR spectroscopy. This is the absorption spectra. I particularly taken a transmission spectra. In case of transmission spectra, uh, you have to take the downward uh, uh, bands, uh, downward uh, peaks. In the absorption spectra, you have to consider the, the crests. These are the crests, okay? This is very important uh, when you are doing the research. Uh, now you can see, again, same thing. Uh, I don't have to discuss, uh, uh, I don't want to repeat. These are uh, representing BOB linkages, the bands around 690. Uh, these are uh, representing BOB linkages in a pentaborate uh, worried groups. And you also have a bands around uh, 800 to 1200. These are representing BO4 uh, units and the bands, uh, vibrational bands around uh, 1200 to 1600 uh, are representing the trigonal borate units in the borate structure. There are various borate structures, uh, di, tri, tetra, penta borate groups. In case of uh, this uh, BO3 units, they are representing meta, pyro, orthoborate groups. I have also taken uh, uh, some one, uh, in one of the research article which I have seen today, I have taken uh, uh, FTR spectroscopy for phosphate glass also. I would like to add some few details uh, upon uh, uh, FTR spectra of phosphate glasses. Basically, the phosphate glasses are characterized by, characterized by these structural units called Q3 units, Q2 units, and Q1 unit, and Q0, uh, Q0 unit. Uh, this, this unit uh, is called ultra phosphate unit. This is ultra phosphate unit. You see, there is there are 
three bridging oxygens and one uh, non bridging oxygen like uh, this is a phosphorus atom which is connected to three bridging oxygens and uh, connected to one non bridging oxygen this is a double bonded oxygen which is the characteristic of all the phosphate units as this structure undergoes the modification this will get further modified into q square unit here this structural unit of the phosphate is uh, is having two bridging oxygens okay Why? because of the modification uh, one oxygen which i am indicating here became a non bridging oxygen it is not going to form a bridge okay so it will degrade the phosphate network another uh, unit is there q1 unit the name i am name i am not given this is the uh, first one is the ultra phosphate second group is meta phosphate it is well uh, listed in the literature and a q1 unit which is called pyrophosphate and uh, the last one is ortho phosphate so very important so uh, we based on the modification this bridging oxygens are going to become a non bridging oxygens so you can see here in case of uh, pyrophosphate there are two non bridging oxygens and one bridging oxygen is as such this is a non bridging oxygen which is which is a natural uh, uh, naturally occurs in a phosphate group and in the last case because of the higher modification all have become a uh, non bridging oxygens so this is uh, going to form a three dimensional structure in a phosphate uh, glass these are going to form a chain like structure it is like a, our organic polymers it is like this uh, q square unit uh, is going to give a chain like structures uh, in a phosphate glass and a q1 unit participate in a small chains because lack of bridging oxygens it is going to form a small chains very small chains in a phosphate glass and this do not participate in a chain structure at all because there are no uh, bridging oxygen at all it cannot form a polymeric long structures so how do you identify uh, in aptr spectroscopy again here a transition a transmittance spe transmission uh, spectroscopy here transmittance uh, versus wave number is plotted and each uh, band is associated to a particular uh, functional group which is listed here you can see that the 514 uh, uh, vibration band centimeter inverse band is associated to <clears throat> vibration of bending vibration of opo group in a q0 unit so you will be able to find out the structures what are formed in a given phosphate class so here it is listed q uh, q0 unit q1 unit uh, q2 uh, unit okay so 640 6, 640 is there there is a 640 vibrational band symmetric stretching vibration it indicates symmetric stretching vibration of po linkage in q1 unit so you are able to find out ortho phosphate pyro phosphate and meta phosphate units and again 760 cm is uh, associated to uh, stretching vibration symmetric stretching vibration of pop linkage in q square unit so on 930 is uh, uh, connected to q square unit and 1100 uh, 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 correspond to asymmetric stretching of pop linkage in uh, q1 unit so on and a 1190 symmetric stretching vibration in again q1 unit thank you all uh, thank you all uh, uh, for giving me an opportunity to present uh, my talk and uh, thank you very much for uh, your patience to listen to my talk yes sir yes, would you sir. like to take some questions if uh, the please, students ask you the questions yeah please sir let them ask okay anybody has any question anybody yes i think there is one question hello yeah, yeah please uh, tell thank you yes. sir for the talk uh, i just have one question another uh, popular uh, investigative techniques for uh, structural units is uh, raman spectroscopy so yes. what is the difference between ftir and raman in terms of results even if we are using both for uh, investigating structural units see raman spectroscopy uh, 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 it, it will also give a finer details about the structure of the glasses okay uh, even uh, compared to ftr spectroscopy raman is more powerful in finding the uh, structures of the molecules uh, raman spectroscopy basically that uh, technique uh, uh, 
the physical technique the physical concept is different in raman and ftr ftr is due to the change in the dipole movement of the molecule both are vibrational spectroscopy both raman spectro very nice question uh, every all of us should know what's the difference between uh, uh, raman spectroscopy and ftr spectroscopy uh, i would like to uh, give some details as far as my knowledge, uh, my knowledge is concerned both are vibrational spectroscopy raman in ftr spectroscopy uh, the uh, the it can be uh, used because of the it uh, detects the change in it is due to the change in the dipole moment of a molecule and in case of a raman spectroscopy it is due to the change in the polarization change in the polarization state of the molecule so this is the difference and uh, raman spectroscopy is much more powerful in uh, uh, finding the structural detail about the uh, uh, functional groups in a given material okay uh, thank you sir thank you yeah, yeah i think there is one more question from ms yeah. jogat from gulbarga university Please. of course he is retired from uh, gulbarga university yes. he is with us he is asking a question uh, uh, the good presentation professor uh, thank you sir have you tried a theoretical calculation of this uh, structural unit by using the uh, the chemical component and all other data Uh, sir we have not tried about theoretical calculation about uh, ftr spectroscopy but uh, in literature i have come across uh, recently yes. there are uh, theoretical calculations uh, about ftr spectroscopy also this uh, but many, uh, many people that uh, I, calculated the q0 q11 iq like that and uh, mostly they will yes. compare experimental as theoretical uh, please assign to yes. your student which is just a uh, Uh, exercise thank you sir thank you very much yes anybody anybody so if there are no questions let us thank the speaker dr n shivashankar reddy for uh, his uh, excellent talk so let us thank him again okay sir thank you thank you very much sir thank you sir so now thank we have uh, a brief presentation by dr tejas r of uh, pg department of physics uh, national college jaynagar so now it is over to dr tejas Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for the symposium to giving me opportunity to talk about some of the things. As now, sir has uh, raised a question that uh, we want to do the theoretical calculations of the how the structure the analysis of the glasses because everyone do synthesis of the samples, but we do the calculations, but we got the peaks. That's it. For the glass, we will not get the peaks. that's a main important thing that uh, i have uh, presenting my work uh, with the consent of our earlier uh, professor dr abiram uh, who has uh, worked here and also he has done some of the works here uh, those things which we taking of these things with that i am going with the my presentation okay thank you with that uh, my work is on structure analysis of metal oxides doped borate glasses which we'll get many part thing is first the metal oxide double borate glasses will come to a thing is we got the lyca cup a uh, lyca cup that's a many part thing where the main important thing is the change in color of the glasses with the influence of lights see some of the movies here so on so much of things we have change the color of the glasses how the glasses are we developed or those things are done but we want to make sure of that the things is how they can be built and but how the structure analysis can be done that's the main important thing of this presentation 
we have done so much of calculations like uh, here earlier two presentations have happened one is uh, here as i said that the xrd uh, graphs and all and uh, professor shushankar reddy sir said that ir spectroscopy of the things where in the, from these two things we are going with the xrd and the crystal structure of the samples and also the main important thing here is importance of ir spectroscopy and also different phases with texture analysis stress analysis particle size analysis have been done but i am mainly focusing on the xrd analysis and ir spectroscopies yo analysis of the samples where we had shown that there are more structures are the borons we have that boron ring structures di diborate triborate ring uh, ring type of metaborates and uh, diborate pentaborate tetraborate orthoborate different borate samples are there but we want to analyze which are the borate things are there in the sample we have synthesized the sample but we want to analyze the sample that's the many important thing of this experiment and earlier the history is many important thing is this is the old history of the glasses we have the glasses having the from the last well, when the decades begin the earth has been begin from that the glass is there but we are analyze the things but we want to take the research and technology on glasses is more important and the advancement of like technology on the glass is more important on these things and understanding the technology is more important for the our basic sciences like physical structural chemical analysis and so on how are the things see if you are having the structure analysis if not, if not glass you'll get a xrd peak like this you'll get the sharp peaks because i think so you are already done with the pg and ug students because xrd characterization some of the things you are done with the ug students also done with the xrd characterizations but don't know how to analyze the things the thing is many important thing is the amorphous and the crystalline nature the differentiating with the crystalline and amorphous nature the amorphous the samples like polymers and other thing will be get like and broadened peaks but if you are the sample is very crystalline you'll get the sharp peaks like this if you dope the things and prepare the glasses we'll get the main important thing is we'll get a peak like this but the main important thing is we not able to differentiate the, the dopants we are doping some of the things here like gold silver and uh, like copper zinc nickel and other things are we are doping here but metal oxide the many point the metal oxides here is here is we want to analyze the metal oxides which metal oxides we are using and you want sir we are using many are using that mobile phones right because we want to use that we want to get contact with others but you don't have the many point thing and also you are using the laptops nowadays but you want the free version of to analyze the things where we get the free versions softwares anything else now the thing is we want to make use of the softwares earlier we are not able to use the softwares like from that we are using the which the jcpds files we are downloading the jcpds files and analyze the xrds but now we have using the softwares by the making use of softwares we want to use the analyze the things see uh, this is the sample where we analyzed this this is the glass sample this is the jcpds file sample which we are analyzing the things these are the jcpds files which gives the main importance nature which is the dopant we are used and which is the metal oxides we are using and this can be confirmed that this is the sample which can be doped with the gold samples this is the main important thing we are going with these things how to analyze the things have a question right how to analyze sir sir you have done showing that the graph but how to analyze no one is telling sir how to analyze the things you have the question right by that we are the going that the institutes like bari as use the softwares they have built the softwares which available for the refinement and different things like sir expo in 2014 qualex and the sunbeam and uh, root proof ochem db and uh, delta drug and crystal mela these are the things 
you can use it to freely available softwares. You can use to analyze the XRDs and also many fun things to find the crystalline structure of the samples. And next is how you uh, do all these things. But the main important thing is the Qualex. You want you have the X, have the XRD data, but you want to analyze which is the data. We have the composition with you, but you don't have the analysis, sir. I don't have time. How to analyze the things? Because now the world is running the running out of time. Because I want to do other duties also, right? So that's way we want to making use of easy way to analyze the things, right? Just go click on the Qualex, the it will show you like this, and then you want to see in the down, you want to see, click on the down the latest version of the softwares. You want to download the latest version, but sir, is it download easily? No, because you want to register this for this. The registration is important who are downloading, who are using the softwares, are you using free versions, are you using for academic purposes, are you using for your other purposes. Okay, this is the main important thing is, this is the main, main, we are using this software. You want to enter the username, passwords and everything else. This is the main important thing that we are the institution. You, you can use your personal also, but you are using for the public research institution. Because it's an institution you are, which your institution you are working, or which your institution you are doing your masters or else PhD or else your UG courses, you can install the things here. Sir, email ID, you have a question that email ID can be using for our college ID or else having that your personal ID. Because please use your personal IDs. For the professors, I am telling that please use your personal IDs. Because the colleges, you change the colleges, then your earlier ID will be lost. So use your personality, that thing will happen for this. Okay, that's the main important thing I'm telling you. And next thing, you can download the things, a Qualex, the latest version of Qualex, but uh, the version is only for the Windows 10, because it is not available for Windows 11. That's the main important thing. They are built for only Windows 10 is available, and not for other also, because if you are using Mac, or other iOS, you are, you are not able to use the things. This is built for Windows version. And next thing is, after downloading that, you want to download two, two things. First is, if you are working on the organic samples, you can go for Pocot 2005, 2205. If you go for inorganic samples, you can go for Pocot inorganic 2205. See, this is the latest version on the updated on May 2022. Okay, but still now this is not updated. Uh, maybe next month, I think so, I am expecting that uh, they are updating that, I think so, they are updating that one, well, new version will come. You want to check with the things, they are to update it versions, because they are updating till now, means till May 2022, you have the power card data, this, these things. This is the later version, you can easily access the things. And after that, please refer the reference, use the reference of this one. For your papers, if you are writing the papers, please, please use the reference where for them, they are using the Qualex, the software. Please use the reference because it's a free version. If you are using the free version, but yes, in not quoting the reference means it's uh, not ethical. Please use the reference of the Qualex. This is a free version of software. And next thing is, on laptop, please. And next thing is, uh, I will because of lack of time, I'm not able to go with the uh, this one. Uh, with the hands-on experience, if you want any, anyone have the uh, hands-on experience, please contact us. We will definitely help you to do the hands-on experience on these things. And next thing is, next thing is, we want to go to analyze the uh, samples. This is the main important thing, where we done with the analysis of the sample, where we are, uh, this is other sample which we have prepared like, uh, sir, we have, uh, I have prepared here that, uh, boron, uh, be boron, barium, and uh, aluminum ox aluminum oxides. Uh, with the, the thing is, which we doped with the nano nah, nah gold here, but the gold is not visible because this is very less. We are doped with a very less quantity. Uh, in that way that we have want to analyze the things. We have done with the other things because see, uh, because the main important thing is we are not able to analyze that uh, boron, barium, and also aluminum in the one uh, crystallography input file. We have many input files. We are clubbed with these things. Here, one is on uh, barium boron oxygen. 
and next is on uh, uh, di gold and uh, barium oxide and next is on uh, boron, boron oxides and uh, barium alumino oxides the samples this is the different different card data which can be used to analyze the things and also if you click uh, for the further studies you want any of the crystallographic files and anything else because you want to use the references right because for writing the th uh, report or anything the thesis or using submission, submission of other things you want to get the references sir you are quoted like this but you want the references where we want to find the references if you click on any one of these files if you go here if you click on here you get you get the card data means what are the cards you having and what is the file they are uh, giving that uh, they have published the data is there it will get from the card this can be if you have hands on experience is there then i'll get you get you back to you after later okay then uh, we have done these things with the gold and silver uh, silver gold uh, palladium samples where these are the things which done by the professor abhiram sir and earlier the earlier class earlier discussions we have done with the ftr data right professor shivangadi said that and also professor iraya said that we have we want to analyze the the vibrational band stretchings where we want to get the metallic vibrations and also bob bending vibrations and stretching vibrations of bo4 and stretching vibrations of bo3 and uh, you have done with some of the uh, water water molecules and uh, bh bond linkages the main important thing is you want to analyze the things from this from the wave numbers from this sphere okay and how to analyze these things the main important thing is you have so much of data but the analysis is very important right the analysis is very important where you have the data like this but the plotting like this is very difficult but the thing is the plotting is very difficult but you can analyze the things which is the main point vibration band of the uh, uh, the sunshine groups or vibration band of other other groups and bop vibrations and bop uh, trigonal and tetragonal borates a different thing you want to analyze the things and you want to analyze how much percentage of the things because by the formulas we want to use that how much percentage of borate or uh, bo4 bonds has happened and how many percentage of bo3 has happened you cannot able to know that these things the how you want to know is the main important thing from this graphs and all and next thing is uh, this is the decolonization spectra see we have done two things we are we are using the origin softwares uh, from that we can do the refinement of the uh, samples and also we have used other softwares uh, for the decolonization things this is we are used it on fit yk uh, fit yk for 1.3 version is available free version uh, this is available in online and that's also free version if you want to learn the decolonization uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us because of the lack of time uh, i'm uh, i'm not able to give the hands on experience on you uh, that's the main important thing we will one day we will plan for the hands on experience on these two things one is on xrd and also one is on uh, ftir data we will do it later and next uh, in person with the coat uh, in person in a i am a person who enjoys the hands on experience of any every, anything i do get your hands dirty that's the thing that drives and motivates me why jos likes this is the main important thing the code please uh, take the hands on experience as a main important thing because you will enjoy the hands on experience but rather than uh, lecturing if you get the hands on experience that's better for you to learn the things from this i am concluding the, uh, the the session and uh, thank you for this giving the opportunity for this. thank you sir thank you thank you yes, any questions any question you want to your comments clarifications or questions ah uh, yes if there are no questions let us yes like what he has already said because of the time factor we have to uh, go for the next uh, topic sir we'll uh, break for the lunch now uh yeah, no matter how much i'll click with that yeah I think uh, till one thirty we can uh, go ahead. Ah, huh? uh, yes, sir. Uh, we will go for the next uh, topic by Professor uh, J. Abhiram. Of course, he was 
here in Indian Academy Degree College and he was the coordinator of PG Department of Physics and he has done a lot and in fact uh, he was the person who started uh, using and telling the students about uh, the preparation of the glasses. Uh, so now he is uh, working in Indian Academy Degree College. Of course, there also he started his work. I came to know that he is doing, uh, the, he is continuing his work uh, in, with other departments like biochemistry and biotechnology. I hope that he will continue with this uh, um, research on glasses. So his topic today's uh, uh, um, is stained glasses approaching towards nonlinear optics. I think we will go over to Dr. Abhiram J. Please, sir. Maximum 30 minutes. Good morning, good afternoon to one and all. It is really, thank you sir for the brief introduction about me to introducing uh, to the place where I have been born. You know, it is like coming back to, uh, you know, it's like, so, I am uh, really feeling that kind of uh, uh, nostalgic feel and when I just met Tireya sir or uh, even when I met uh, Tejas today, a new team has evolved here and uh, my dear students, I wish you all success. So. Yes, sir. And in fact, uh, we both have uh, exchanged our uh, locations. <laughs> sir was earlier at IADCA. Now uh, he is at NCJ. I, I was at uh, NCJ earlier. Now I am at IADCA. So that's how it is. So coming to the topic. Tejas. Tejas. Good afternoon. So now I'll be uh, starting with my topic, stained glasses approaching towards nonlinear optics. Okay. So outline of my talk will be on elementary concepts of glasses, ideation of stained glasses, nonlinear optical properties of gold or silver nanoparticles doped in dichroic borate glass systems. Then a small historical perspective of these stained glasses. So these are the things which I'm going to cover in my lecture today. So the word glass, it has been called as vitrium from Romans, meku and ilifaku from Mesopotamians and kach, ranjika were called by uh, Indians in Sanskrit literature and uh, somewhere uh, during the uh, Indo-European trade, people used to address it as gehel. This is the word which they used to use. Okay. So then Gehel has been converted into Glesem which leads to old uh, German text and thereby the etymology of uh, the word glass has been derived from Glesem to glass. So there is lot of Indian connect with respect to this subject. So what you see over there is nothing but as my friend Tejas just uh, told you about the Lysergus curve, this has been used by Romans earlier. So, uh, the beauty of these glasses, if you see here, it is opaque in nature. It is opaque. 
but when red wine is poured into it it strikes ruby red so that is the beauty of this glass how is this possible what is the mechanism behind it that is nothing but it is the dopant that has been used in this glasses those dopants are nothing but gold nanoparticles or gold based tin nanoparticles and coming to the second one these are some famous gothic architectures that has been developed in the european nation so this is nothing but these are again stained glasses which are been used in cathedral churches so how do we define glass so coming to the standard definition of glass glass is an inorganic product of fusion which has cooled to a rigid condition without crystallizing so this is as per astm then james shelby has slightly modified so this definition this standard came across in the year 1945 in the year 1997 shelby came across a definition where he speaks about the uh, lacking of long range ordering in the network because earlier in this morning people had told you about what is a crystalline solid and amorphous solid the basic difference between a crystalline solid and amorphous solid is crystalline solids have long long range ordering whereas amorphous sol uh, solids have short range ordering so the first condition is short range ordering and the second condition is it exhibits a phenomenon called as glass transformation so this is the two basic criteria which is required to define glass coming to the next important aspect is you know if you are trying to look at the definitions if you just uh, look at professor kj rao's definition he said a solid obtained by supercooling liquid that is x-ray amorphous then again uh, vasudev karmakar he defined glass as a non crystalline solid which exhibits uh, tg over volume enthalpy relationship and again this is the new definition by our previous coordinator and my colleague and my co-guide and my friend dr r rajaram krishna where he states that glass is an amorphous solid which exhibits glass transition temperature by arresting the kinetics below super cooled liquid region by surpassing the crystallization this is the holistic definition of glass which has been formed the latest in the year 2019 so how does this how does this glass gets into formation so the basic thermal idea of this glass is so there is a A very famous uh, time temperature transformation diagram according to this what we see here is this is called a seeker so if you are trying to look at the glass e region that is nothing but anything any material if it is if it has been formed below this nose point or the nose time then they easily get classified into glasses whereas this curve it speaks about Uh, the recrystallization curve or the that is the place where it undergoes crystallization so as per the definition of glasses it has to surpass the crystallization rate of crystallization so the glassy region falls under this category so it has to be quenched rapidly so if i am trying to heat the sample around 1500 degree celsius the moment i pour the glass probably within 2 minutes or 3 minutes i will be able to touch and feel it that means the rate of cooling is somewhere closer by to uh, you know around uh, more than 1000 uh, 1000 kelvin per second that is the way how that glass tries to cool itself so the rate of cooling is so high so because of the higher rate of cooling they do not get settled it is like you know when uh, we are into this auditorium if the rate of cooling is slow everybody can occupy the seats e easily if the rate of cooling is so high most of them cannot occupy the seats they get randomly occupied so that is why rate of cooling plays a vital role in defining the crystalline as well as amorphous solids so getting into the next important classification of glass system glass system has been classified into modifiers intermediates and formers so zecherian he he speaks about any uh, element if you are trying to use its coordination number greater than 6 they fall into the category of network modifiers if it is between low coordination number between 3 to 4 then they get into category of formers 
then if it is having a coordination number between 4 to 6 they fall into the category of intermediates where depending on the concentration and composition of the matrix they can be either a former or a modifier so that is why we call it as an intermediate okay so sun classified this uh, glass based on the bond strength as well as diesel classified the uh, glasses based on the field strength so if we are trying to look into the uh, selection selection is completely based on our kitchen which we call it as periodic table here so here uh, the first group elements basically if you look at this i have been given a code called as m m refers to modifiers so the first group and second group elements of the periodic table they fall under the category of modifiers so coming to boron silicon phosphorus germanium arsenic and uh, tellurium so they all fall under the category of glass formers so aluminium bismuth titanium zirconium they fall into the category of intermediates so this is how we try to make use of the kitchen and then we try to synthesize the gases and if you are trying to look into these uh, chromium manganese ferrous uh, cobalt nickel copper or any lanthanides all these elements they have been used as dopants so we try to use them in a very less quantity okay now having said this the most important thing when we are trying to deal with uh, the stained glasses especially which are doped with gold or silver nanoparticle the first important thing that we come across with them is they exhibit a characteristic feature which you call it as surface plasma resonance so what is surface plasma resonance it is nothing but it is termed as collective oscillation of conduction electrons at an optical resonant frequency okay so for example if i have to say uh, this is possible only by noble metal nanoparticles such as gold silver and copper okay so what happens is if i have to say what is the uh, when i say it is resonant frequency so it is associated with the wavelength so if i say around 410 nanometer silver exhibits surface plasma resonance around 532 nanometer uh, gold exhibits surface plasma resonance and around 600 or 625 nanometer copper exhibits surface plasma resonance so coming to this uh, surface plasma resonance if i am able to uh, tune this surface plasma resonance i will be able to get the entire range of this visible region so if i am able to stretch from uv vis to nir and if i am able to activate this spr that means i will be t dealing with the water window so why do i require water window water window is nothing but most of our biological tissues cells they all fall under that category of water window so if i am able to probe these uh, nanoparticles with them i can find much effective applications over there so that is why we try to take the stained glasses towards nonlinear optics as we go ahead further i will try to explain how we are getting into that so now what happens is as you are trying to redshift redshift in sense you are trying to uh, just tune the uh, instead of having spr you know instead of generating spr at 410 nanometer but, uh, nanometers that is possible only for uh, only under the spherical condition if the shape of the particle nanoparticles is spherical then we get it at 410 if it is ellipsoidal in nature they get distorted and they might get red shifted so if they get red shifted what happens is it experiences increase in size of the particle and it leads to agglomeration so this is this is nothing but this is why we say that red shift of spr leads to agglomeration as well as increase in size of nanoparticles so now coming to the concept of linear optics and nonlinear optics so what exactly linear optics is so uh, before getting into this i have a question does the refractive index of the material vary with respect to intensity of light does it vary with respect to intensity of light i am not talking about the wavelength with wavelength yes wavelength varies with the refractive index but the intensity it doesn't vary such materials are basically categorized as linear optical materials suppose if you are trying to deal with the high intensity such as when i say higher intensity it is nothing but the laser beam when i probe with higher intensity there is a variation with respect to 
the linear, uh, sorry, the refractive index in the third order as well as second or, or second or third order as well as the absorption coefficient in the second order or third order. Thus, they lead to a phenomenon called as nonlinear optics. So, that is where nonlinear optical materials come into the existence. Any material which exhibits a change in refractive index or the absorption coefficient with respect to incident intensity of light, then we call such materials as NLO active material. So, what does it do? So, once if you are trying to shine some light with respect to linear optical material, the input light and the output light will be the same. The input frequency and the output frequency will not vary. Suppose if you are using an NLO crystal or a glassy substrate which has an NLO with it, there will be some change in the output frequency. Okay? So, now there are two kinds of uh, uh, phenomenon that we come across with respect to NLO. One is second harmonic generation. The beautiful example for second harmonic generation is the ND act crystal laser. So, when we look at some uh, experiment, if you even if you if you are uh, very easy, you can approach Google Baba and ask to show a, a demonstration of India laser, it will show that it will be showing 532 nanometer. It will show some green light that is being generated. That green light is generated only because of the second harmonic generation because neodymium atom has its ground uh, state uh, that, that energy difference, it occurs at around, it emits radiation at around 1064 nanometer. When it passes with respect to yttrium aluminum garnet crystal, it undergoes doubling of frequency which we call it as a phenomenon call it as second harmonic generation. So, because of that you are able to see that it has been emitting the radiation in the greenish region 1064 by 2 is nothing but 532. That is why you are able to see that they show they shine light at green region thereby that we call it as second harmonic generation. Similarly, if I am able to, so when light incidence on a nonlinear optical crystal it leads to formation of a second harmonic generated wave and there will be again a redundant normal frequency wave. Similarly, there is also a possibility of third harmonic generation. So, third harmonic generation is nothing but instead of having two photon absorption here, we will be having three photon absorption as a phenomenon. So, that is how they are different from each other. This is not restricted only with the doubling of frequency. You can also check something called as optical summing frequency. So, accordingly what happens is when this is called this phenomenon is called as wave mixing. It is called as four wave mixing. What we are trying to do is we are trying to use omega 1 and omega 2. So, when I use uh, uh, sorry it is just wave mixing it is optical summing frequency. So, when I use omega 1 and omega 2 in terms of uh, a, a nonlinear optical crystal it will lead to generation of omega 3 which will lead to addition. There is also a possible which we call it as optical difference frequency. So, if I am using three different wavelengths, then it will lead to a new omega which we call it as a fourth omega that is why we call it as four wave mixing. So, this is an advanced concept which we deal with the nonlinear optics. So, in case my dear students if you are interested to learn about this you can interact with our uh, coordinator Vasudevan sir because he has worked in this field in uh, U University of South Wales. So, he is also aware of this uh, four wave mixing concepts. So, now uh, in case if I have to say this NLO it leads to various applications. One is it leads to the sensors especially if you are trying to deal with uh, the gold or silver uh, nanoparticle based sensors especially in terms of uh, surface nanotron spectroscopy, they then they tend to give larger amount of uh, signals. So, the, the de detection of cancer cells will be easier. The second important thing is as they exhibit surface plasma resonance they can be uh, I had already told you that uh, they have a wide range of applications when we try to tune them in the UV vis region in our region. So, we can use them in photodynamic therapy. Similarly, if you are trying to check for the applications over here, so they they are also possible 
in using it as optical switches, optical fibers. So, we, what do we do in optical switching and optical fibers? That is nothing but we try to enhance the quality of the beam. So, in, in case of uh, optical switching what happens is the light gets amplified, it behaves like a laser. That is what we do. What is optical computing then? Nowadays people are working in quantum computation. So, even in that field we, we need to actually generate a beam which can be summed or differenced, differentiated. So, this is where my one of my friend is working in field of uh, quantum computing. She is working in St. Uh, Stevens Institute. So, she is working on the same field, but they do not deal with the materials. What they do is they try to code and develop that optical summing or optical difference frequency. So, this, this NLO as such has a wide range of concept, it has wide range of applications. Okay. Now, getting into the nonlinear optical properties or uh, the, the method, how do we study? We study using one conventional method which we, which we call it as Z scan. This is to study the property of the material. So, what does it contain? It contains a high power laser, it contains some detectors, mirrors, beam expanders and a translational Z stage, an optical filter. You have a detector for open aperture detector and closed aperture detector. So, what does it open aperture detector do? Open aperture detector will give you the data related to absorption coefficient. Closed aperture data will give you the data related to refractive index. So, there is one more thing which I can say with respect to z. z is equals to x plus i y. So, what is x? x is the real part of the susceptibility, i y is the imaginary part of the susceptibility. The real part of the susceptibility is nothing but it is associated with the refractive index. The imaginary part of the susceptibility is associated with the absorption coefficient. So, this is how we try to uh, define the susceptibility in sense when it has been divided into two parts. So, now when you are trying to place your sample here, if you look at this beam, this beam is not linear. It is a Gaussian generated beam. Even with respect to the sample or without respect to this, with even with or without the sample, the beam appears to be like this. But when you place the nonlinear optical material here. This is a clo uh, closed aperture setup. You can see that there is one aperture that is present here. So, this will undergo some change. Based on that change, you can define whether the beam is self focusing or self defocusing. Again, here it is an open aperture setup. If a peak appears, then we call it as an optical switch, or if a valley appears, then we call it as optical limiter. So, this is the basic idea that we try to generate from this experiment. So, this is nothing but it is a simulation which you can perform using one web application which is mentioned as 3D optics. It is a beta version. You can uh, log in for 3D optics and you can do some uh, simulation experiments on your own. What you need to do is you need to register. That is it. Rest everything you will get the access you play around because dealing with lasers is very difficult. If you are trying to do it on your own in your laboratory, it will be very difficult to manage with high power lasers. So, if you, you are able to generate some simulation based experiments, based on that result you can approach for the real experiments. So, this is one thing which I would like to highlight along with this. So, now how do we choose the nonlinear optical property materials? So, basically any material which if I am trying to deal with nonlinear optics, that means that material should exhibit high optical transparency and it must have high nonlinear refraction coefficient. It should have lower linear absorption coefficient and the most important thing is if I look at these three points, if I have to reach the market, it has to be cost effective. So, if we if you can just check what is the cost of barium borate crystals, they are highly expensive. Quads itself is highly expensive compared to glass. So, now can I make use of glass and convert it into a nonlinear optical material? Is it possible? Because glass is cost effective material. So, yes, it is possible. So, if I have to create glass, if I have to enable glass as a nonlinear optical material, the first challenge that I have to generate is I have to make it slightly anisotropic. 
that anisotropy works the moment if I add some dopant or impurity. So here I am trying to dope gold or silver nanoparticle or gold and silver nanoparticle. That is also possible. So this is one what I am trying to do. The second one is I am trying to choose element in my composition with larger hyperpolarizability. So if the hyperpolarizability is larger, then even then they try to uh, make the sample to be active for nonlinear optical property. That is nothing but it is trying to create anisotropy in the matrix. Then we must ensure that there is a larger concentration of non-bridging oxygens. So if you are dealing with borate glasses, especially with alkali borate glasses, there is one phenomenon which we call it as boron oxide anomaly. According to that boron oxide anomaly, it is like up to 33 mole percentage of alkali what happens is it leads to formation of bridging oxygens. Beyond 33 mole percentage of alkali content in the matrix, it leads to, it will, it will, bridging oxygens means it is trying to create the network. Beyond 33 mole percent, what happens is it will slightly try to degrade the network. That depolymerization of that network is nothing but as a result of that, it will lead to creation of non-bridging oxygens and these non-bridging oxygens are responsible for improving not only the non-linear optical properties, even if you are trying to look at the transport property or even if you are trying to look at bioactive properties, they play a vital role, okay. So with respect to our study, whatever I am going to discuss today, I am going to limit with my optical limiters. So I have just tried to uh, make sure that I am trying to drop in only with optical limiters. What are optical limiters? Optical limiters are the materials which will resist the high intense incident beam of light. It will permit the low incident beam, it will not allow the high incident beam, it is just like a filter. Okay. So why do we require optical limiters? See, uh, suppose imagine if you are trying to uh, get exposed to a lab which contains uh, laser. Laser is high intense beam. If you are using ordinary glasses, your eyes might get damaged. So you require something to, you require a shield. And those shields are nothing but optical limiters. It is not only for our ordinary eyesight, even for electronic eyes, that is nothing but the detectors that we are trying to use, even they require some shields. So the protective layer is nothing but the optical limiter. So this, this is what we are trying to design in our work. So now, as we go ahead, as we go ahead, the, uh, this is nothing but the kitchen. So here I am trying to choose my matrix. I am not, uh, I am just trying to say that I will be using uh, the borate as my glass former, then lithium as my modifier and uh, zinc as my intermediate, so zinc plays a role here, as well as calcium, which is again another modifier, and I have gold and silver, which are going to create those stains in my glasses. So this is how I am trying to generate a material which is suitable for nonlinear optical properties. So I will not be dealing with the structural uh, studies because already uh, all the three lectures have been dealt with uh, structure properties. I will be dealing, focusing only on how these uh, actual uh, nan nanoparticles look like and then how, how it is correlated with the UV as well as the NLO. This is what I am intended to speak about. So coming to the next important thing is this, this I will just skip, I will, you can just glance. So this is nothing but it is the process which we used to synthesize glasses and these glasses were made here in our uh, National College Jainagar. So we have uh, two different furnaces, one is for uh, uh, synthesizing, another one is for annealing. If you see I have set it at four different temperatures. Let me tell you why we need to send a st uh, have the step process. This is around 150. Why did I set it at 150? I had to set it at 150 because I need to eliminate those because uh, morning you had that question, what happens if water molecules are present inside the glass matrix? To avoid them, to avoid the hygroscopy nature, we try to set it at one, 150 degrees and 
hold the temperature for 25 minutes or 30 minutes so that water molecules will get expelled from it. Then again, we try to set it at 438 degrees Celsius. This is to expel chlorides which are present in the uh, precursors, dopant precursors. So if I am trying to go with uh, 600, that is to expel carbonates. Then 1050 is the melting temperature of these glasses. So if you can see that these are the beautiful glasses and I have used J brand crucibles because I am a poor guy, I couldn't afford platinum crucibles. So just this is a, uh, easy uh, porcelain crucibles which is available at the cost of 65 rupees. So that's, that's the uh, thing which I wanted to highlight here. So coming to the work. So let us get into the electron microscopy studies. So when we look at this SEM EDAC study, so here I have just named those glasses as G1 and G2. So there is one glass which contains, uh, bo both the glasses contains gold, one glass with higher concentration of uh, lithium, another one with the lower concentration of lithium. So the particle size have been estimated by the histogram. So based on this, uh, so here your EDS it will confirm, you, here with the EDS I, I cannot make the elemental composition because of the choice of my uh, uh, matrix contained uh, lithium in it. One that was the disadvantage, other one is the borate signals will have enormous uh, distortion because of, because the target itself is lanthanum hexaborate crystals. So with EDS we, we cannot confirm the elemental composition, exact composition of it but I can confirm whether the gold is present or not. So the gold signals were confirmed using this. So here I was able to check with the interplanar distance, it was clearly visible with this 2 nanometer and it was uh, found to be around 2.25 and 2.17 for the glasses. And this very well it correlated with the X-ray diffraction uh, studies. As well as uh, what we see here is uh, for uh, glass 1 it was sh exhibiting 31 nanometers and for glass 2 it was exhibiting 23 nanometers. So coming to the uh, optical properties, so in case of optical properties what we see here is, as I told you please uh, if you can recollect the first slide when we spoke about surface plasma resonance, the red shift correlates with the increase in size of the particle. So if you see the AU SPR for G1 glass, it is around 604 nanometer, whereas for G2 glass, it is around 578 nanometer. So that means it is, it is very well correlating with the values that we got across in the previous case. That is, it is nothing but this is uh, having larger uh, size of the particle, uh, like 31 nanometers, whereas this is correlating with 578, which is correlating with the 23 nanometer as the size of the particle. And direct band gap and indirect band gap studies were also been performed. Along with that, I have, I have performed something called as Arbac energy. So what exactly deals with the Arbac energy? Arbac energy speaks about the strength of disorderness in the material. When I say strength of disorderness, it will also co uh, correlate with the formation of more non-bridging oxygens. So if you look at the non-bridging oxygens, it is uh, for G2 glass it is around 836 milli electron volt, whereas for G1 glass it is found to be around 528 milli electron volt. So it has larger non-bridging oxygens. So what will happen to the non-linear optical properties? Do you think, which one, now an open question to the uh, students, based on uh, the understanding of whatever I have said so far, which one do you expect to exhibit larger non-linear optical properties, either G1 or G2? be louder, G2, right? So, yes, as you said, it is going to be G2. So first, let us look at the uh, self-focusing effect. See, as I told you, self-focusing is nothing but it is the study which speaks about the nonlinear refractive index. So what happens in this is, if you are placing the crystal, it will try to focus the beam. It will try to increase the intensity. So what happens in self-focusing is, so this is the focal point. When it is zero, that is the focal point. So there is a pre-focal dip and post-focal peak. 
if you have this kind of combination, we call it as self-focusing effect. Suppose, if I have a pre-focal peak and post-focal dip, then we call it as, sir, just, just 10 more minutes, sir. Remind it up. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, sir. Then we call it as, uh, then we call it as self-defocusing. Okay, so coming to this, what we see here is the uh, nonlinear uh, refractive index, as you said, for G2 glass it is found to be higher, and nonlinear absorption coefficient was also been found to be higher. And I have also, you know, this second order hyperpolarizability of the glasses, which also says that G2 glasses is found to be higher. So it very well correlates with the value, and the takeaway message from this uh, glasses is it clearly says that the glasses are nothing but if as the sizes size of the particle decreases the nonlinear particle uh, uh, nonlinear optical property will lead to enhancement so this is one so is this uh, dependent only on the size of the particle no it is also dependent on the shape of the particle so here what i have done is i have tried to incorporate gold nanoparticle along with the silver nanoparticle if you look at the particle size, it is almost closer by to 19.5 to 22. It is almost similar. There is no much change in the size of the particle. Whereas, if you look at the aspect ratio, aspect ratio, I think you are very much aware. It depends on the shape of the particle. So, the shape of the particle will vary from 1.15. When I say it is almost 1.15, it is almost spherical. It is not perfectly spherical. The range is almost spherical. But if you look at glass which has... Uh, 3G2S, it has somewhere closer by to 1.4. So, that is having larger ellipsoidal slit. So, how does shape help in shaping the nonlinear optical properties? So, before get, uh, getting into the nonlinear optical properties, we need to get into the optical properties of the glasses. So, if you are looking into the optical properties, here, earlier at least we had some idea that if it is undergoing some redshift or blue shift, it was uh, it was confirming that what is happening with respect to the size of the particles. But here we have a component which is having two different dopants which exhibits SPR. One is gold, one is silver. So if you look at the uh, gold uh, uh, SPR here, this is this is something which is interesting. For silver, it has undergone redshift. For gold, it has undergone blue shift. So, how can I confirm with the uh, size of the particle? That is the reason why, because of this uh, fight between gold and silver, uh, you are able to see that the, uh, SP, uh, the size of the particles is almost found to be sim uh, similar. Again, with respect to the uh, Arbac energy, Arbac energy is found to be, uh, you know, even it is, it is not clear. It has been, it shows that GS glass exhibits maximum Arbac energy. But with respect to this glass, 3G2S, the Arbac energy is found to be slightly intermediate. The minimum was found to be in 2G3S. So, what exactly happens here is, this particular uh, combination, it does not depend on the size uh, or this, uh, this does not depend on the size of the particle or the Arbac energy. That does not speak of even non-bridging oxygen does not emphasize much on the uh, properties. So, what exactly leads to uh, the non-linear optical properties here is, so if you look at the values, the values are found to be higher for the glass which exhibited larger aspect ratio, that is 3G2S. That means, if glass is found to be more ellipsoidal, it exhibits more non-linear optical properties. So, this is what we try to come across with respect to the Z-scan studies. So, this is the overall summary of whatever I have said. So, these two glasses, the first two glasses, they say that if the size is reduced, then there is an enhancement of nonlinear optical properties. Then, this combination of gold and silver, they confirm that as the shape of the particle tends to be more ellipsoidal, they exhibit more nonlinear optical properties. So, it is very clearly understood that the size and shape of the uh, particle, nanoparticle, emphasizes on the tailorability of nonlinear optical properties. So now, 
we came across the self focusing effect the self focusing effect it arises because of kerr nonlinearity and you, uh, the uh, modification of refractive index if if it it behaves more like a focusing lens so over a period of time if it is more focusing then it will lead to damage of the material so this again it depends on the intensity of the incident laser beam so what why, how does this rsa behavior appears so what is the main uh, thing that we see here so if you look at it it is appears because of the excited whenever the excited state of absorption cross section is larger than the ground state uh, absorption cross section and as i said it, uh, the au nano clusters they depend purely on size and au and ag they pure uh, they depend purely on the aspect ratio and the entire non linear optical property in this case it has been exhibited due to the two photon absorption process how do i say it is due to two photon absorption process it is nothing but if you look at the band gap energy of these glasses the band gap energy is somewhere closer by to 3 so uh, the wavelength that i have used is somewhere closer by to 1 uh, 1.5 electron volt that is nothing but 800 nanometer so if you convert from electron volt to wavelength you will get to know what is the band gap energy and you will get to know what is the uh, thing so if it is uh, to if it is exactly between uh, the half of its value then we call it as two photon absorption so coming to the uh, comparison so there are few glasses which i have compared with uh, my data and other data so this i will try to skip because you are uh, i think we are uh, we need to come to the conclusion at the earliest so z scan so this is the z scan setup which we used at uh, university of hyderabad in uh, akraham lab under the so, uh, gu uh, guidance of uh, uh, professor uh, soma venugopal rao these uh, studies were been performed by one of my friend dr jagannath who is currently working in uh, cgcri kolkata okay so one of the most important thing that i would like to bring to our uh, this one is uh, uh, information is in the symposium is there is a major gl uh, glass contribution if i have to uh, take from uh, vedic era to the modern era you can see that india has been a contributor for glasses okay then there were also been uh, then from india it moved to thailand then again there were some uh, glasses which started even in uh, uh, places like egypt uh, some says egypt have uh, started this glasses some uh, literature say it was india some literature say it is somewhere in uh, russia and uh, if we are looking into it so there is a connection between romans they used to take sea uh, sea route and then they used to trade with us so that uh, that is why we call this as something called as arikemedu to rome arikemedu is a traditional glass making site which is uh, present even today at uh, uh, pondicherry tamil nadu so if you come across few sangam literatures you can see that there are lot of glass glass beads glass makers who were present in southern part of india so how they used to make glasses this is something called as mortar and pestle which is which has been you know these are all uh, generated from an excavated site so then look at look at their uh, heating element they they made use of terracotta woven so they used to place terracotta woven and cover with some sand and then this glass synthesis were made with respect to the natural sand that was available in the seashore so coming to the glass beads these were the glass beads which were made uh, in uh, the ancient uh, this, these are all ex from the excavated site and they tried to polish and try to revive these glass beads so few beads were not revived yet so it was still it was trying to appear like some uh, beads over there so this is nothing but our laser laser so there is also something where romans used to trade so they call it as pudoke pudoke means emporium that emporium pudoke they which eventually lead to puducherry which is nothing but pondicherry so the name itself is nothing but it is connected with the roman name even the if you are trying to look with pondicherry uh, what we call now so there is there is some connection historical connection with rome so uh, there is also vedic connection which is associated with glass science
so there is something called as amsubodhini uh, so i won't try to deal much with the sanskrit names here so it is if we try to mix these 23 elements in a crucible called garuda guhari still we have, we need to find out what are these elements that are present and this this unit i am not avail, uh, aware of yet so 300 kakshas then it leads to a glass so when one jyoti if it falls into it it leads to sahasra jyoti that means it amplifies light 1000 times maybe it might be it might sound something different but there was a concept which was mentioned in that book called as amsubodhi coming to rasajala nidhi there we say that gold when it is uh, it is red when it is melted and it leaves a saffron tint when it is rubbed on the stone so this is the, this speaks about the color of the gold so this is nothing but ruby gold was available earlier as per the thing so that means gold nanoparticles were part of our uh, uh, indian uh, uh, chemistry which we call it as rasajala so again the nature of gold was is nothing but it comes up with this particular uh, uh, shloka so coming to this last one is these are four different crucibles one uh, asti samisa and uh, uh, kapala okay so they were all made up of bone uh, and mud and lead uh, lead and mud clay plain mud cow dung so what they used to do is they used to heat uh, silver either it is pure or impure in form they used to heat it 17 times and then mix it with 3 uh, 3 uh, uh, to 32 parts of gold which which will lead to formation of reddish white element which we call it as uh, shvetata so this is nothing but this is again an important uh, thing that we have to emphasize on the uh, presence of golden nanoparticle in uh, the uh, chandragupta maurya's period this is from arthashastra kautilya shastra arthashastra so if i it would it wouldn't be uh, you know i will not be able to do justice if i don't thank people who were around this is my family so he is my guide dr uh, rajshekra kem uh, he is uh, i think most of you know he is our uh, my co guide dr r rajaram krishna he is jakrapong keko so you know iraya sir had been here he was also my mentor during my doctoral uh, program he is uh, professor in chayachit he has also he has also mentored me during my doctoral program and uh, professor soma venugopal rao i have to make special mention on him without his support my non linear optical uh, property studies wouldn't be possible and i wouldn't have come up with a talk which speaks about stained glasses approaching towards non linearity so coming to this person he is jagannath he is the one who actually helped me out by getting uh, things characterized at university of hyderabad so he is our uh, professor Uh, late dr rv anwekar he is the one who defined the problem at the initial stage but unfortunately he is not present today we have also dedicated a lab in his name in our uh, pg physics department so then he, they are my research colleagues so he is vinayak patar uh, ar venugopal sanjay then i am i am also thankful to stick uh, kochi dst facility because uh, without their support i wouldn't have got uh, the uh, tem studies done i wouldn't have analyzed the size of the nanoparticle so they are my friends chetan pramod sir rajgopal sir uh, sumanta uh, siddhu uh, tejas shivraj maidur pavan malvika arvind jagannath and kaushik they not only them uh, if i try to fill this uh, slide it will be more and more because i am i cannot restrict the people so in next few upcoming years this slide will reduce uh, my family contribution much lesser because it will be more people whom i'll be meeting further so it is because of them so before i conclude i would like to say stay hungry stay foolish thank you sir thank you and now we will restrict to only two questions anyway uh, during lunch time you can have your discussion with him in the staff room of pg department so now only two questions from two especially from students 
Yes, anybody? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. audible right yeah yes 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 you are audible uh, sir thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation especially the uh, way it was presented was actually very neat and appealing thank so you so my uh, question is uh, so since you said it uh, deals with the shape of the uh, yeah so you said uh, shape of the glass also matters a lot in the nonlinear effects. No, not shape of the glass. Shape of the nanoparticles inside the glass. Yeah, yeah, sorry, okay. Yeah. So sh shape of the nanoparticles uh, inside the glass that deals with, sorry, that affects uh, nonlinear effects a lot. And uh, since you also brought up a surface plasmon uh, resonance as well, so uh, have you dealt with the concept of me resonances, which also deal with the same thing with the which. Uh, affects the, uh, which is affected by the shape of the uh, scatterer, scatterer. No, I have not uh, worked on those uh, lines yet. Okay. So, I have just worked on uh, the optical properties and uh, based on the optical uh, UV uh, study, I have just characterized the SPR peak and then I have done this. Yes, sorry, I just got that since you spoke about the shape. Yeah, the it is, it is interconnected, yeah, yeah. but uh, I have not worked on the theoretical line yet. Yes, yes, thank, thank you. So you. Thank you for the wonderful question. Yes, yes, please. Have you ever tried with gold and silver nanoparticles? Have you ever thought of using gold plates like in bulk or half bulk like that? The idea is to actually deal with bulk to nano. We try to reduce it to nano here. So, what we can do, if, as you said, Instead of using gold foil, you can coat a gold layer of film on the thin film substrate and then you can again check with the surface plasma resonance. So with the foil by itself, it cannot show. That is uh, what I believe in. So it has to be as thin as possible because it is surface dependent phenomena. So anyway, let us thank uh, Dr. Abhiram for his excellent talk. Thank you, sir. And of course, uh, we have completed four uh, lectures and you know already that's why I'm not going to repeat it because of the time factor and I hope uh, we are adjourning for the lunch now and uh, everybody in the staff room only, physics staff room. So we will go to the physics staff room, of course our students